Hello and welcome to another episode of CNF Book Club. For this one, Dan Ackerman and I sat down with Jaron Lanier, a VR pioneer and author of last year's book, Dawn of the New Everything, which talks about his time in VR in the 80s and 90s, and also a new book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, which is about social media. So we talked to him a little bit about both. We're here at CNF Book Club episode uh, who knows what. Um, and today we're talking about a lot of things, but with uh, on a couple of different books. Um, Jaron Lanier, Lanier? Jaron, yeah. Jar- Lanier, I don't Jaron Lanier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Jaron Lanier. <laughs> um, Donna knew everything, and uh, your new book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, which is a, a follow up. Um, so we want to talk about both. We'll start with the most recent one. Uh, and there are a lot of really, really timely things that are popping up in this book that we've been dealing with for years and are coming to a head right now involving the worlds that we live in and feel like we can't escape. And it could not be more yeah. timely. In fact, you were just telling us about how you made a last minute change to the book, which came out like in March, about something that just happened. Yeah, well, you know, this book was um, kind of an unplanned pregnancy is the way I'd put it. Right. <laughs> what happened was I had a, a big book, Dawn of the New Everything, last year. And whenever I would go and talk to the esteemed media, uh, I, they, they would say, well, okay, all this VR stuff is good and fine, but you're, you, you were one of the earliest critics of mm-hmm. this whole manipulation advertising model for internet companies, and now it seems like it's gone dark with the election and everything. Mm-hmm. What do you have to say for yourself now? And uh, I, I realized that um, I hadn't really written about that for some years, and I started coming up with things to say, and I realized, wow, this could be a little book, that, you know, like my little collection of things I said. To th- so this was kind of driven by journalistic interest. So I just put this thing together fast. I gave it to the publisher said, hey, why don't you publish this as a mini book? And uh, then Cambridge Analytica came out, and it was already at the printer. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my god, OK, look, pull it, pull it, pull it. I just need to add some more stuff. And they're like, you can't do that. It's getting printed. And I'm like, what do you mean? All you do is you stop the printer. You stop the presses. Like They even said that in the 40s, right? Stop the yeah, presses. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, okay, but you can only use existing white space on the pages. You can't change any pagination because otherwise... You, you know, have to redo everything. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I just I just redid a few things. So at least uh, a little bit of the more current stuff from 2018 is at least acknowledged in there. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, um, this is a long-term problem. It's been with us. I've been writing almost the same stuff since the early right. 90s, which yeah. is so insane. And... Um, uh, but what's really insane is that we're still somehow living with this stupid problem that's not in anybody's ultimate interest. The problem being that, um, right. that we've adopted this business plan for consumer internet companies where if you and I connect or you and I connect, the way that's financed is some mysterious third party person behind the camera over there uh, <laughs> is paying to manipulate us and otherwise we can't do it. And then we eavesdrop on that conversation and figure out what to do based on it. Well, what they do is they, 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 they eavesdrop on us, and then they use algorithms to figure out what little stimulus to give us that will manipulate our behavior in a way that they can then measure. And it only changes slightly. They can only affect us a little bit statistically, and only some of us. But a small statistical change to society, if it's methodical and consistent, it's just like compound interest. It can build into a big change in society. So it's made the, the whole world sort of darker and more paranoid. It's reversed the course of increases in democracy around the world. It's made social movements go dark. Um, it's, it just sucks on every level. And so uh, that's the thing we have to change. And that's what the book is about. And- yeah, gonna, and that ability to, to manipulate people, even on a tiny level, when you spread out over a billion and a half Facebook users, that's where that scale comes in and you're able to move mountains. Yeah, so, you know, what the algorithms can do is they, they can um, automatically just test and watch for what little tricks happen to work for people without really having any solid model of how the brain works or anything. They're, what we call AI is still really crude, if we're honest. Mm-hmm. But one thing that's really upsetting is the main application of AI is the manipulation of real people right now. So there's something deeply twisted about the whole field for the moment. But let's say, just making something up, um, there's an algorithm that discovers 
that around the time your rent comes due every month, if they show you ads in red, you respond a little bit better because maybe you're nervous and red mm -hmm. means that you. There's no theory behind it. There's no professor in a cubicle somewhere who said, oh, red will mean the same. It's just a mathematical correlation. And then they manipulate you and your behavior changes a half a percent. But overall in the population of millions of people who, ha who are correlated with you through your behaviors or what you've bought or who you know or whatever, there's just like this little 1% change. But then that's consistent over time. And then as they get better and better at manipulating you when you're nervous, all of a sudden when a collection, uh, when, <laughs> when an election comes up or a collection, uh, <laughs> they make you just a little more paranoid. They can make you a little, um, uh, somebody can come along and, and kind of basically distract you or make you right. cranky. Um, and, and, and so it's, it's small changes distributed methodically and algorithmically that are screwing us up, you know, and, and, and it's, uh, um, it's just making for a lot of kind of people with these kind of cranky, addicted personalities, like our president at the moment, who's an addict, and it's uh, it's creating this absurd situation where it's hard to talk about anything real. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned it, like going back to how the internet was was conceived that that this was a, a problem from the get go, and that uh, you know your belief in that if, if there have been more, not just the way that links are constructed, the way people's identity remains somewhat shadowy, but um, the, not having any ability to have micropayments. You mentioned a lot about the focus on yeah. some sort of financial way that we can be the ones paying, therefore we're the customers versus the other way around. Yeah, this was a kind of an interesting political development. So the first people on the scene to think about how you'd make a digital network, including uh, notably Ted Nelson around 1960, um, looked at this and they said, well, here's what a network should be. Um, anytime two people do things, there should be links in both directions. Um, uh, there'd be no reason to copy things anymore because that'd be a big waste of energy and everything because you could always link back to the original. People could get royalties not only on putting something up but on how they reused. You could have like mashups of mashups of mashups and the whole chain could be understood and people could share revenues from it if it was monetized. So there has to be like a, a two-way links, a payment system, and everybody should get memory to store their stuff. And they should have an identity that's theirs, that's secure. That was the first idea. And what happened was around, so for those who think Al Gore inventing the internet is a <laughs> joke, it's actually kind of true. Like I was there and he didn't, he's not an engineer. It's not like he invented packet switching mm -hmm. or any of the things that make the internet work. But there were all these people who were going to do separate nets that weren't really going to talk to each other because mm -hmm. people were as jerky then as they are now. And he said, well, hey, we'll, we'll throw some government money at you to bribe you. And it, they kind of started to interoperate. So that was actually a real accomplishment. That was no small thing. Uh, we'll see if it lasts. At this point, it's, it's sort of being undone in my view, but mm -hmm. let, let's leave that aside. Uh, yeah. So, but during that time, there was such an intense... Um, wave of, um, how would I put this? There was like this, there was a super faith in making everything free and open. The, mm -hmm. the Wikip well, this was before the Wikipedia, of course, but, but there was a, the free software movement was already going mm -hmm. with Richard Stallman and all that. Right. And there was a, a analogous idea as music should be free, culture should be free. And uh, this very strong feeling uh, led to this idea that the internet shouldn't dictate anything except the most basic raw possible capability. It should be the most minimalist design possible. And then we'll leave it to private enterprise to fill in all those other pieces like identity and commerce and all that stuff. And the problem with that is that because of network effects, it's a network after all, what we did is we created this paved way for these giant monopolies. Right. So, mm -hmm. of course, there was going to be one giant thing like a Facebook. And of course, there was going to be a giant thing like a Google. Uh, the, the, and we kind of knew that was happening. But somehow I thought, ah, well, whatever, it will survive somehow. And then we also had this idea that since nobody should have to pay for things, the only viable business plan for all that stuff would be advertising. But then advertising which really was kind of nice at first, like the earliest Google was kind of cute in terms of the ads, but um, because of Moore's Law and people just getting better at algorithms and customers getting savvier and other actors who are maybe not so nice figuring out more and more about how to, to game the system, what started off as advertising morphed into this massive behavior modification system. And that's how we ended up with where we are. Um, 
so one way out of it is to in my, is to change the business plan. Um, you could try to re-engineer re the internet so that more of the basic functions are just part of it and, and they're taken away from these companies. I don't know, there's a lot of different ways you could fix it, but we have to fix it. Yeah. Well, that's, would, yeah. would anybody get on board with doing that? That's the problem, getting people off what they're on now. Yeah, now the advertising thing is so interesting because yeah. advertising traditionally, Scott and I both come from a, a print and broadcasting background. Mm -hmm. It's literally broadcasting. You put your ad out and hopefully a few million people will see it at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. same ad, and maybe they'll buy a, a shoe and maybe they won't, whereas online advertising has become the most ultimate type of narrow casting almost to the individual, and, and, and that's why it's so different. Well, it's kind of like fly fishing at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like very specific. But yeah, uh, no, it's worse than, because like, it's it's more like, um, it's not even fishing, it's just like sticking you in a, in a Skinner box. It's like this continuous, we'll observe you and we'll keep on changing the stimulus until we learn how to modify keep your behavior. Keep optimizing, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, I don't mind ads, I mean, I think advertising has been a part of modernizing. I, I, I don't think we'd have the benefits of technological progress without advertising. Not that I love all ads. Sometimes they're certainly annoying, but um, not on CNET. I'm sure they're all very pleasant ads and, and beneficial to the user. But, but uh, the thing is... <laughs> the Those thing are the great is, ones. Those are the great ads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, advertising is not the problem. It's behavior modification. Mm -hmm. It's this continuous yeah. observation of people to keep on finding the way to, to manipulate them. That used to be really rare. That was like something that only happened if you were in a in a cult or you know a, a psych experiment yeah. or something. Um, to do that universally is new territory, and I, the results so far are not encouraging. Well, do you think uh, what I kept thinking about too, reading, reading the book, uh, you, you were mentioning like in one example, at least with with cable television, that, like. You know where you, you would think that advertising wouldn't continue, but then people were paying and there was still advertising. Mm -hmm. Like my, my worry is that if people did, if you introduce a new economic system, would that behavioral modification might still remain as a layer in terms of like a an intertwine in some odd well, way? Yeah, I mean, um, this whole business. Th there are a few different philosophies um, uh, competing right now about how to fix this. Okay, yeah. so one of them is regulation. So the idea is that you'd say, um, you, if somebody says, don't use my data to manipulate me, you can't use your data. So the EU is experimenting with that. There's this GDPR thing. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. very first day of the GDPR, people lodged complaints against Google and Facebook mm -hmm. uh, saying, you know, under GDPR, if I tell you I want to access your site, but you can't use my data to affect what the site shows me, you can't just refuse me. You have to do that. And so that's going to litigate now, and we'll see where it goes. Um, another, another idea is to just nationalize the thing totally so it becomes like the public library system and the government runs it. Um, in the U.S., there's such a, uh, a strong strain of libertarian thinking mm -hmm. that that might sound abhorrent to people. Maybe it should. Um, on the other hand, I have to say the public library system has been one of the most beautiful and beneficial inventions of the whole history of mankind, in my view. So um, I don't think it necessarily has to be a terrible thing. Um, the only country experimenting with that right now that I know of is Papua New Guinea, where they're talking about shutting off oh, Facebook yeah, yeah. and starting a, yeah. starting their own version. I don't know how that would go. I, 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 I honestly know very little about Papua New Guinea. I know a bit about yeah, their music, yeah. but that's about it. Um, uh, and then... The, another alternative, which is the one that I've been um, most associated with, that I, I've been exploring, is to re-monetize the idea of networking. Okay. So, so you'd pay to use it, and then you'd get paid if you contribute a lot. And it would create this whole expanded economy where the data would be just paid for instead of uh, uh, free. And uh, what I, I know a lot of people have questions and have doubts about it. And I, since we haven't tried it much, it's hard for me to say a lot about it. I, there are a couple of experiments that have been good, though. Um, it used to be that people thought uh, in the future there won't be studios like this. Instead, everything will be created like the Wikipedia by volunteers mm -hmm. who are unpaid. We actually got an experiment. We had an empirical contest between people trying to do that, of whom there were a lot, and then uh, people like Netflix and HBO trying to use the Internet to create dire a direct billing relationship mm -hmm. with, with individual right. customers. The direct billing thing created this thing we call peak TV, it just worked better. People are enthused about it. Um, 
whether you like what's on Netflix or HBO or whatever is, I, I can't say, that's up to you, but most people seem to like this stuff and it seems to be this really big deal that's been a success. So that, like, if we could do that to social media, so we get peak social media, you'd pay for it somehow, either monthly fee or as you go through micropayments or however it works, but I think you also should be paid. And, and I can get into that in a second. I think that's really important. But you just make it part of the economy instead of this weird, non-economic manipulation, bizarro economy. Like, make it just normal. You buy and sell stuff you want. Yeah. Well, that was the other uh, <laughs> interesting thing. It was fascinating the way you talked about AI throughout, throughout your book mm -hmm. and throughout your books. Uh, where, you know, skepticism about it is, a, you know, sort of a religion or... Uh, and also, the, the thing which I had never really thought about till I, I think till I read your take on it, uh, how much um, these um, different algorithms are based on human knowledge and expertise. That at the, you, know, you mentioned the translating, uh, mm -hmm. that this is based on people who are doing translating work, the, the works of art that are building these algorithms that seem then like computer art. But to the degree to which uh, remonetizing what seems to be the work of, of the system that's really coming from someone else. Yeah, so, you know, <clears throat> there's this kind of weird thing going on. So uh, there's a lot of people from the tech community, <clears throat> not, <clears throat> pardon me, I shall clear my throat. There's a lot of people who are warning that we're going to have this massive wave of unemployment because of AI. And these are not anti-tech Luddite weirdos. These are people from Silicon Valley. And what they'll say about it is, well, we'll have this economy of, of people being very human, being loving, the loving kindness economy, it's called sometimes. So there'll be nurses and stuff. And everybody will live off this basic income where they'll get welfare, basically, because they're not needed anymore. And to me, this is just moronic. I, I just can't, because here's the thing. AI runs on data. We get data in. That's the training set. The machine learning algorithm works with the training set. And then it, do, then it does something that's a kind of a derivative of it. That's the paradigm. Occasionally, you can have um, AI work with a small training set. But there's always a training set. It works with data. The data comes from people because there's not any aliens or angels around here to give it data. So what you're telling what you're telling us is that the data which comes from people will be used to make the people obsolete, except that the data came from the people. So they mm -hmm. aren't obsolete because they're still needed. And and so like the usual retort to this idea that AI will pe put people out of work is, well, it's never happened before. They always said that people be put out of work by cars, they'd be put out of work by this and by that. And of course, that's true. Every time somebody said, we're going to have a wave of unemployment because of new technology, they've been proven wrong because it turned out people were needed in new ways and the new jobs were better than the old jobs and everybody was happy. The only difference this time is we're pretending that the new way that people will be needed is actually not, like we're just, we're, we're pretending, we can, we're saying we'll steal from them instead of paying from, you know, the only difference this time is we don't want to pay the people for the new way they'll be needed. And I mean, it's like criminal, it's stupid. So every time somebody says, oh, basic income or loving kindness economy, um, you know, say, no, just pay the people for their data. It's like a better, more dignified solution. Mm -hmm. Then you'll motivate people to make better data, and they can take pride in the quality of their data. Everything about it is more humane and more sensible. Everything will work better because the data will be better. Um, and by the way, all the people who say, oh, we're going to have basic income or this loving kind of thing, they're never saying, oh, and raise my taxes to prepare mm -hmm. for it. I want to start paying more taxes to start paying everybody because I'm going to put them out of work. Nobody ever says that. Mm -hmm. the, the underlying thing is I have a right to steal from everybody. You don't. You don't have that right. Pay them for their damn data. Yeah. The methodology is you get someone to train the replacement version of themselves who doesn't need a lunch break. Mm -hmm. right. And of course, the first people are going to replace are the nurses. Uh, mm -hmm. That that sort of high investment, uh, you know, low low margin job. Well, they're already replacing their truck drivers. My favorite story about this kind of stuff is they talk about coal jobs coming back, and the first thing that happens is they start replacing the coal truck drivers with with robots, with with self driving coal trucks. Yeah. Well, the the. the um it's every type of AI has a slightly different profile. So for self-driving vehicles, there might actually be less in terms of data payments to people because it's more about just gathering road data. But for something like uh, nurses, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of data taken from people on an ongoing basis. Um, and, and this gets... <laughs> We can really get into the weeds with this because a lot of people who really just don't like the they just really want to be able to steal everybody else's data. They'll, there's a zillion objections and it can get very complicated. Um, but um, fundamentally, it is theft. I mean, if we want AI to be anything other than theft, we have to give up the theft part. 
Do you think, um, do you think as far as voice assistants go that they're, I mean, is that, is that part of the fantasy uh, of AI or do you think that's basically going to hit a wall or, you know, because that's basically all anyone's talking about now in terms of, you know, like the big, the big companies. The voice? Yeah. I mean, it's like they're pushing that more and more. So. Right. right. Um, we're going to have artificial as assistants uh, bilking each other with fake blockchain cryptocurrency schemes. That's the future. Oh, yeah. We're already talking <laughs> yeah. about having... <laughs> I mean, the Google Assistant call another right. robot assistant yeah. at the yeah. dentist to make Duplex an appointment, and they end up talking to each other. No one things. will ever name their child Alexa again. Yeah. It's now a forbidden name. There's an increasing yeah. belief in, in these sort of, like, conversational element of these. Well, look, yeah. um, I really want to emphasize, I have no objection to a voice yeah. interface any more than I have objection to any other kind of interface. I think... Let's make our machines beautiful and usable. The problem is not the voice interface. The problem is not using p personal data to make a voice interface. The problem is stealing the data in order to manipulate the people using the voice interface. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> I, I was really, <laughs> you know what, what I thought of when, um, when Amazon had its first successful year getting people to buy its smart speakers as gifts, it reminded me of uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey because this was one of the cautionary tales about how computers could go wrong and it has this round thing that just sits there mm -hmm. and watches you and talks to you, Absolutely. but it ends up being a murderer and they have to shut it down. I'm thinking like after that, after this fundamental warning from decades earlier, people still bought HALs. <laughs> Right when they had a chance, and it makes yeah. me worry about like whether whether cautionary tales about technology even work. But um, I, I we certainly have to keep trying. Um, I think most people who grew up with all the cool you know cyberpunk books now that were also cautionary tales mm -hmm. are using those as inspiration for having built the the new wave of VR worlds, <laughs> and so it's sort of the same thing. Even like a you know a modern Ready Player One, there's caution in that, or it's definitely caution in Neuromancer or Snow Crash. But people always talk about those as works that inspire them to create something that's like the metaverse. About the fourth time you recreate the dinosaur DNA, you think you right. would learn by now that it's probably not a good idea. Right. <laughs> right. They keep opening those parks. What do you think? Who's um, insuring yeah. these places? It's funny you bring up Neuromancer because I, I used to know Bill Gibson, and yeah. uh, well, I, I just I just saw him again in Vancouver actually, and. Um, in the old days, I used to always complain to him, like, oh, Bill, you're making VR seem so negative. And if you just talk about the positive thing, it'll be like this magic spell that'll make people use it well instead of becoming creepy. And he would, he would you know, um, uh, let me know that that was a stupid way to talk about writing, <laughs> but, which is right. correct. He was, he was correct. But it's funny, like, I was worried that he was being too dark. And the truth is, maybe he wasn't mm -hmm. being dark. Or another, we, um, I worked on this thing called Minority Report. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, we tried to, we, it was, I think, a reasonably articulate warning about how things could go wrong and how trying to predict and run society would, would go amok and useless. Useless. So I also the I, personalized people advertising still referring that to it. Great. Yeah. Right. They say let's make something like Minority yes. Report. That would be great. I think no, every, it's part time, of every time you know it's what. Uh, by the way, the Minority Report. Um, I I, uh, I actually made working versions of those gadgets. Like the the very first um, Face mm. Finder was this algorithm. Mm. Uh, my friends and I sold it to Google, but. Um, that was the thing where uh, somebody somebody's trying to escape the police, but they're put mm -hmm. into these ads along the way so the police yep. can see them. That was we, I made that. That was like a that was a scene idea, and I actually implemented it. And it, way way back then, it was the very first time it could be done. Um, but um, the uh, uh, I guess this book is an experiment. Like okay, we tried warning you, we tried mm -hmm. talking about it in advance. A lot of people did. Um, when I say we, I mean a lot of the computer science community going back to the beginning. This is not like a new revelation that these things mm -hmm. can be problems. We've been, a lot of us have been talking about it for a really long time. So now it's happening. And so th there's an old line from uh, in, 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 the, in, in the world of sales that you tell somebody what they're going to see before they see it. You tell them mm -hmm. what, they're, what they're seeing while they're seeing it. Then you tell them what they just saw. And then maybe they'll get a little bit of it. All right. So yeah. um, I think it might have, maybe it applies to these political and tech warnings too. We told you what you were mm -hmm. going to see. This book is, I'm telling it to you while you're mm -hmm. seeing it. And then next year somebody can write one that that's what just happened. <laughs> you know, and hopefully. Why you should have deleted your social some media point, account last year when yeah. you still had time. Yeah. At some, at some point somebody gets it. You know, I, um, I still am really optimistic. And if I wasn't, I wouldn't even be doing all this stuff. But, um, it's, you know, um, I, I, 
people are very vulnerable to being duped and hypnotized and manipulated and that's that's what's going on and it's very hard to come to them rationally and say oh hey you're being duped and tricked and manipulated snap out of it it doesn't you know it's like hard to find an angle in well mm -hmm. addictions are hard i mean i related to a lot of those feelings reading the book but it's like anything you're doing that's bad that you say, well, if you, you could recognize that it's an addiction, but being get, getting getting off of it is a whole other thing. And then you still find there's a tremendous challenge there. Or I do, at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everybody says, oh, I wasn't, yeah. you know, I didn't buy those shoes even though I saw the ad. So this time I dodged <laughs> it, and so clearly it doesn't work on me. Right. Well, all right, a positive spin that's possible is you could say, in those olden days when there was less technology um, and uh, most children didn't make it to adulthood and people lived to 30 and died and that was normal and uh, a lot of people were hungry a lot of the time and plague swept through all the time and all that stuff, which was not long ago at all. Mm. That was just last century, even early this century, um, or I mean early uh, 20th uh, and, and certainly 19th. Mm. And um, uh, you can say that in those days, the immediate problems people faced weren't um, mind games between them as often as they are today. And the reason mind games between us have come to the fore as our biggest problems is because we can afford for them mm -hmm. to. That we're comfortable and the basics are covered enough. But unfortunately, that's only true like in the short term. Um, I guess the scenario that worries me the most is that we're making ourselves so crazy through this new society we've created of mutual manipulation that we can't face the real objective problems like climate change. Like we're, we've blinded ourselves to the survival existential issues we have to face up to. And uh, that's ultimately, if we didn't face any real problems, like I guess I wouldn't really care that much. Like, okay, go, you know, whatever, D you know, do whatever you want as long as you don't bother people too much. but. Unfortunately, that's not the world we're in. We're in a world where we actually do have to get it together. And we can't give up on the idea of truth. We can't s divide ourselves into mutual hate groups. We can't do any of that stuff. Uh, I know there's, you, and I wanted to talk about VR as well. There are so mm -hmm. many things to talk about. But um, in, in the VR landscape, there is a bridge, I think, here yeah. where, where uh, you know, I think about the, the current generation of VR hardware. And I was wondering what you think. You, you mentioned I mean, the, two, the two biggest behavior modification company empires now being Facebook and Google. Fortunately, making... neither of them are involved in VR. Right, so thankfully. We, we don't <laughs> so, have to so worry. So we're clear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're <laughs> like, how do you, how do you feel HTC about those HTC guys you really got to watch out for. Right. So, I, I mean, how do you, you kind of talk about that in, in Don and they do everything to some degree, but I mean, how does that feel right now in terms of Well, to me, there's a little bit of a comedy in it because Google and Facebook are the only two of the five tech giants that really are dependent on this mass behavior modification um, business plan. Yeah. And they're addicted to their own business plans so that they can't diversify their own profit centers. But they can diversify their cost centers, so they just do that compulsively. Yeah. So Google will say, well, we'll make a company for balloons, and we'll make a company to solve death, and we'll make a company for, I don't know, just all these endless things, right? And it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all a desperate way to try to find some way to diversify their profit centers. Okay. And, in a way, um, the VR investments of these two companies are serving perhaps um, as a symbolic way of them letting their investors know we really are trying to diversify. <laughs> if they really want to diversify, they have to give up their addiction to this stupid business model and then they'll serve their investors better. So that's one thing to say. Um, another thing to say um, is, um, well, uh, then we get into the details. Um, there's. Uh, there's uh, uh, the guy who founded Oculus himself got mm -hmm. addicted to the very stuff we've been talking about and turned himself into a mega jerk. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I hope he can grow out of it. Um, oh, yeah, um, I, there are a lot of wonderful, really great, brilliant people at both Oculus and uh, the, the various Google places. Mm -hmm. um, I was. <laughs> I shouldn't tell a story out of school. Maybe I will. <laughs> I so you know I, I I do my research at Microsoft, but I'm friends with everybody, and I'm not promoting Microsoft or anything. But yeah. I was uh, I I was having a meal with a certain very high up uh, Google figure, and they said to me, you know, you keep on introducing our VR people to each other, but we're we're trying to keep them separate so they'll compete with each other. <laughs> And, but they find out about each other through you. Could you stop that? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to 
going to stop that. I like, like, this is ridiculous. Anyway, so I don't know. I Google is funny. It's like this giant archipelago of um, these competing groups and this, this, uh, um, my main problem with Google these days is their idea about controllers. Because so they, they've been kind of behind this idea that you have this little three degree of freedom mm -hmm. one button mm -hmm. thing. And to me, the greatest joy in VR isn't so much being in a world, but transforming yourself, mm -hmm. becoming a weird avatar, and, and having your own interaction, your own sensory motor loop be the, 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 the canvas in which you learn about things. So you don't look at triangles, you become a triangle if you're going to do a geometry lesson. You don't look at, oh, I don't know. Uh, you don't look at a lightning storm. You could become a lightning storm. I've never tried that. But um, <laughs> there's. But I mean, that's really yeah. where VR yeah. comes into its own, and that's where it's distinct from other things. And so you should want more and more of your body being measured instead of less and less. And that's the, yeah. I, I really wish that they hadn't done that. I, it's going to take us like a decade or two to outgrow this stupid. Well, that, that was the, the most argument. annoying part of yeah. that standalone. Scott and I headset. had this ongoing argument where we we both used all the you know current gen headsets way going way back to when Oculus was a yeah. pair of ski goggles with a with a cell phone screen shoved inside. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, Scott feels like things like Oculus Go and the uh, uh, the Google stuff. Well, where I'll it's tell three you what. I've got. Okay. You tell me. You're, I'll tell you exactly. What Scott we're is more make. supportive of the new disconnected <laughs> phone-based systems than yeah, I am. Yeah, tell me what's your take. What's your uh, take? I, I, I think once you try a six-degree yeah. real full thing, there's no going back. Even though you feel like you're hooked up to yeah. some sort of monster. Mm. Well, I like where it's going with mobile, but I, I it's not fully there yet. I, but I yeah. think it needs yeah. to be untethered. I think it's such a step backwards in so many ways. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. if I may point out, yeah. gentlemen, <laughs> yeah. the first proof of concept that you could do an untethered system that was totally yeah. self-sufficient with a complete tracker was HoloLens. Right. Right. So um, I love that. And, yeah. But but the other thing, the HoloLens was the first um, device intended to be a see-through mixed reality um, uh general purpose device, let's say. And um, and obviously, if you're going to add stuff to the world, you need to be able to move around in the world where the stuff is. So uh, having a cord is ridiculous. So it absolutely must be untethered. There's not a choice. Otherwise, it just makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I think um, if you're going to be... Um, and I guess what these days, <laughs> I, uh, to distinguish these things has become more and more awkward. I say classical occlusive virtual reality. Uh, so right. it's like too many syllables. But anyway, if it's one of these old fashioned things where it's like uh, uh, cutting totally off. closed off, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So I, um, having the cable might not be as bad, although there are still safety issues. And people should at least model where the cable is in their software. It's not that hard to keep track of whether somebody's wrapped themselves around it or something. I mean, <laughs> seriously. It still seems to happen yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Get, no, I, I, uh, uh, that's something every software developer should like really think about. But um, uh, I mean, of course, it's also nice to have them cordless, but in a way having them cordless might make them more of a safety hazard. Like you have to really, mm. you have to think about the whole system and the use scenarios and make sure you're thinking about the safety and the comfort of the person. Um, but I, one thing I want to say is, at the moment where you've gotten to the point of a six degree, how geeky is this show? I, don't <laughs> I know. know. We're, well, we're seeing it. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, we, I don't know. We, right. we, we span the gamut. You're talking to VR guys. We, we, so, yeah. we know a lot about VR, so we have to show the right. full six degree. No, but I, yeah. I'm worried. Like somebody tuned in and they're interested in their book in books. And they're like, oh my god, <laughs> these these are like this right. is like this <laughs> geeky nonsense. And I these are like those horrible people from across campus who made all the money. Yes. Screw oh, them. God, yeah. But anyway, uh, um, apologies on that behalf. Hopefully they're still watching. I don't know. We're gonna. Talk Talk about the VR tech now. So the next episode elements. of this podcast will solve murders. Right. <laughs> I want to assure you that Dawn of the New Everything contains sensitive literary passages that are at least reasonably well written with real character development and dialogue. Really? Yeah, okay. Very but now much back so. to the. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, <laughs> Should we talk about if that you get to the well? point where there's a headset that has a six degree of freedom tracker mm -hmm. that's inside out, right? At that point, you're sensing the environment well enough that you're just a hop, skip, and a jump from being able to sense a lot of the body and certainly mm -hmm. your hands. And um, so, for God's sakes, if you're going to do a cordless headset, don't do one of these stupid little three degree of freedom things. Do at least get the people's hands. I mean, it's really worth that extra bit of effort. And I'm, I'm a little mystified that anyone would go to the trouble of an inside out tracker without also grabbing the hands. I just like, I, yeah. I don't know what they're thinking. Um, well, my favorite but, experiences, which made me think of what you're saying in the book and, and, and what we're not addressing now and mm -hmm. kind of bring it down to the, the human level too. 
I guess well, you talk a lot about haptics, and, and that's like the missing part, mm -hmm. like what you do with your hands now. But then also, uh, it was interesting, so much of what you call a virtual reality was about people, uh, that without a consensual world between people, then it's, then it's just an experience. And there are so few of those. I mean, the one I tried, it, they, and they, most people can't try this. Like at, at Tribeca, they had this one with a theater piece with live artists where I wore, um, you know, like it was like a hand scanning leap motion. It was called Jack Part One, and there were live actors, and we were yeah, in that. a space. Yeah, it was one of the most exciting things because you don't get that that often. Well, see, yeah. it's an interesting, it was kind of uh, thumbing its nose at traditional entertainment economics in an interesting way because the, the big problem right. with VR venues has always been the proportion of workers you have to pay versus person paying ticket. So, mm -hmm. um, as I described in the book, in the uh, way back in the 80s, I tried to build a VR venue with Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. from before Minority Report, you know, and it was very, very hard to do because you have not only expensive the equipment of the day, these days the equipment is cheap, but um, you have to pay people. And like the question is, like in a movie theater, you have maybe four or five people working and you can have like a hundreds of people in there. Mm. Uh, so the, the ratio is favorable. So in this case, there were like five or six people working just for one person to have an experience, <laughs> which yeah. is like great. <laughs> And so for people who didn't see it, there's like somebody around with a fan to mm -hmm. blow the window on yeah. you and somebody stomping on the floor to give you some haptics. But You're there's like this whole cable. performance. It's a whole like personal for theater one piece. person, yeah. which is amazing. So the person gets a personalized, improvised experience, but it's economically yeah. the least viable thing ever. Especially in a mall. It's like, it's yeah. like, it's, like a, <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's a conceptual art piece about anti-economics, and, mm -hmm. and, which is great. I'm glad they did it, but it's like not going to happen a lot. But, right. uh, <laughs> Um, you know, um, there are some people doing, I think, interesting multi-person uh, uh, virtual world design right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'll mention a couple on uh, sort of um, more articulate, small numbers of people at a time. Chris Milk's work is getting really interesting. Yeah, it's great. And uh, uh, there's so many people. Oh, there's just okay. Can I can I rant about something else? Yeah, yeah. All right. Please. So let's say, <laughs> all right. Let's say you find yourself helping a friend who's non-technical get their VR set up at home to work. Right. Some of us have found ourselves in this position. Right? We always say you need a VR caddy. Yeah, yeah. and so you say, oh, you okay. That. So you install this thing, and then they're like, uh, don't hit that button because that'll send you to the Steam store. Oh, no, don't hit that button because that'll send you to the Windows house. Oh, don't hit that button because that'll send you to uh, uh, the... Well, here, so here's the thing. Once you get into the multi-person, uh, the, the, the large numbers of multi-people worlds, there's like seven or eight of them competing now. Mm -hmm. And by the time you're in there, there's like eight eject buttons to get to different <laughs> right. hub levels. And so basically, the, the, the chances of anybody not ejecting themselves to some <laughs> hub, you know, becomes so really true. Yeah, so, so it's it like, oh, no, I'm out of it. And I said, okay, which house on a mountain are you on? Well, they all look the same. Okay, do you see a city in the background? No. All right. Then, do you, I mean, it's, it's like really yeah. good to that point. It's so, it's so ridiculous. So there has to, this imperialism where everybody wants to grab your eject button to send you back to their hub is, is really making the user experience like harder and harder. And it's, it's mm -hmm. bizarre and absurd. Um, so, but for the moment, there's going to be this giant um, like um, hub warfare, people trying mm -hmm. to, and, yeah. and the thing is, look, um, without, um, without, let me just say they all suck, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so that way I can be really fair to everybody. Yeah, there's yeah. no hub that's worth it right now. All right, none of them are that great. So um, we've got to figure out some way out of this. It's just like this ridiculous problem, but... Um, and they're all kind of striving for it now. Like I oh. play with Oculus venues. They're all trying to like get people now to spend wants... time together. Yeah. So uh, there's a, there's a bunch of them, and I have like a real fondness for a lot of them. Uh, we have one at uh, we got one at Microsoft that started outside that we acquired called AltSpace. Really mm -hmm. sweet people. Yeah. Really lovely. Um, Phil Rose. I worked on I worked with him on um, Second Life years ago, mm -hmm. and he has high fidelity now. And he's really, I mean, they're just really devoted people and. I just did a thing with Science Space, and they're super devoted people. Like, there are all these people doing these wonderful, there, there's a bunch of them, you know, and um, I don't know what we can do about that. Because if network effects really come into play, you know, mm -hmm. somebody will get, will grab this thing. Obviously, Facebook would like it most of all. Google would love it. <laughs> right. But anyway, I kind of hope it'll be one of the little indies who gets mm -hmm. it somehow. But then they'll get all sucky after that, so. My favorite hub experience is the Inception hub of going to the Microsoft Cliff House and then going into the Steam Bridge app 
from there. <laughs> right. You have to click on a, oh, oh my, my Steam is up on the wall in my Cliff House. I got to go in there and then get to my Steam games through the Cliff House. Yeah, um, well. For my, for my Windows headset. I, look, but you know, it's, it's not the fault of any one of the companies. It's just like this giant, this is exactly, this is what packet switching was like before Al Gore came along. Mm. I, this, was, this was before the internet. There was like all these different things and there were like these awkward bridges. And so, yeah, we uh, in a weird way, Steam could almost do it because they're uh, you know, Linux and Windows and Mac and Oculus and Vive and other VR platforms, except they can't stop letting people making uh, uh, school shoot 'em up games on their platform. Mm. Yeah, well, there's, there's a number of platforms within platforms on Steam. In fact, it's almost impossible. It's really, you're, you don't even get warnings. Like you think you're yeah. downloading a single game and you've actually entered somebody's platform who wants a new ID for you and everything. And it, it happens all the time. Um, Actually, that, that brings up a kind of an interesting speculation of whether there could be a new Al Gore-like figure who comes along and says to the VR, all right, we're going to throw some government money at you. Fix this. Right. <laughs> Make this interoperable. This is stupid. Uh, hey, this is how Trump could cement his legacy. Fixing VR. Like, yeah. Could, <laughs> That'd like, be an throw, unexpected turn. Throw, throw a bunch of money at all the yeah. VR people and say, okay, interoperate, you, you, you bums, like, fix this. Mm -hmm. yeah. That would be, that'd be kind of funny. Because it, it, Gore succeeded at it, so why not? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, VR doesn't even need to be like. You, I, I was just thinking about other things. I was thinking about like that doesn't even need to involve a headset. Like I think that was another thing your your book was bringing up a lot of times in terms of that whole spectrum uh, that, that VR has encapsulated so many different things from large scale to small, and then the hot, uh, and then the Connect is basically a type of a of mm -hmm. VR experience in some ways. I think I think about VR right now. Everybody thinks about the headset, yeah, yeah. and to 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 some degree, uh, expanding the definition of what it means to be making this type of thing, uh, loosening up a little bit, getting people less less locked into that. Well, I mean, I'm I'm really open minded about my about it myself. I like whatever works. The headset does have a kind of an iconic appeal because, like, mm -hmm. the thing I kind of like the headset. Um, in almost the opposite way than most people do. Like the usual tech industry approach is let's make it as small as possible mm -hmm. so it looks like glasses. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a, that doesn't work because then other people just feel like you're being sneaky. Like this person is looking at me with instrumented glasses. What do they, they think they're superior to me? What are they, what, are they, what, are they, what, are, what advantage are they trying to get for themselves? I don't so think it works the, emotionally. Uh, glass hole effect. Glass hole or Uncanny yeah. Valley glass hole. Yeah. Well, it, it, we've, seen, we've seen two experiments yeah. so far, uh, which is Google's glass and then uh, Snap's uh, spectacles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And both of them came to about the same point. Now that doesn't mean that the third one won't work, but uh, I, I, I tend to think three is a pattern. So we only have two so far that, mm -hmm. that have been significant. So let's see if somebody can fix it on the third time. But if the, th if the third one also fails, let's treat it as a pattern. How about that? Yeah. But anyway, um, I, I prefer to go in the other extreme. I want to say, I have this big thing on my head. I am proud of it. It's like my samurai helmet. I think it's great. And I want to make, I want to put tech on the outside. Like one of the things, a prototype I've built, um, it's not economical to sell it yet, but it has a multi-view display. So from the outside, depending on the angle you're looking, you'd see my avatar making expression. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a dynamic mask, hmm. an expressive dynamic mask. So it's for the benefit of other people in the room, uh, not for me. But I think that that's like, you should advertise. Like I am going to make the, the biggest, most elaborate, most amazing thing, and I'm going to stick it on my head. <laughs> I'm proud of it, and I think that that's the way to go. And I, I like these little sleek things. I, I, I don't, I don't buy it. I think emotionally, it's completely misguided. That doesn't mean I'm going to talk anybody into this sin, but uh, that's that's my own that's my own view. Do you think that means like smart glasses in the whole world of like walking in a mixed reality world in your everyday life? Is that like something that's problematic or do you think that's like something is it related to that like everyday well, I, versus a session let's, so to me yeah. like let's say you had a sort of a a fairly large visor so you have some airspace um, you can talk normally everybody can see that you're in so there's a, there's a, there's a fundamental question of honesty and disclosure there's no there's no sense in which you're faking and they can see what avatar you are in the event you're in avatar within mixed reality and they can uh, maybe they can see reflections of what you're seeing so that it's not entirely private um, you have to think about the power relationship between people. People are social creatures who are very, very sensitive to that. So if you have something on your head mm -hmm. that from your perspective is giving you some advantage and it's private from somebody else's perspective, it's this power play that's sneaky. 
And I think, like, the question is, do you really want that? Does giving that impression actually achieve anything for you? And, and I think the answer is no. I think it's stupid. I don't think there's any reason to do that. I don't think it's... There might be some specialized situations where you want it. Um, Heads-up displays can be great for surgeons or whatever, but... Um, in social interactions, I think it's stupid. The okay. reason to do it is for beauty and to have new things to share. So why not share? Like, don't don't have sneaky things. Have it be really open, really upfront, really honest. And then you can do new virtual sports together, or dance or make music together in the space between you or whatever it is. But it's on honest, uh, mutual terms of equality and, and uh, trust. And once we finally do all that, all we'll get is wave shooters of monsters running at you one at a time. Well, for 20 years. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of optimistic about things. Like, uh, I, uh, but I think the only way to be an optimist is to sort of be um, uh, pessimistic tactically, and then you can be optimistic mm -hmm. strategically. So you have to be um, kind of a critic in the short term and really push and push and criticize and criticize, and then things actually get better. So um, overall, I think we can. VR really can turn into a beautiful thing, but in the near term, you know, we have to be critical about it. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it's like you mentioned that, and I think uh, I think it was the, the newest book about like it, we're all I've, I've written it down. We're all seeing different private worlds and are accused to one another become meaningless, um, mm -hmm. which makes me think about what you're mentioning there about like not being sneaky at, between data and VR and worlds, like building a, a bridge to communication versus you know I think that the challenge now is you're getting to a point where it's it seems like. VR and AR are, are pushing more towards everybody having their own experience versus a, a communal yeah. connection. I, yeah, I, I, well, you can have your own experience, but it shouldn't be hidden from other people. So in other words, yeah. if there, I, like, let's just say hypothetically, there's some weird flying lion angel thing that's like hovering and does whatever. Maybe nobody else is interested in that. Maybe it's just for you, maybe it's private, but other people should see that you have it mm -hmm. so they can understand you. See, there's a difference between private and hidden, mm. right? So, um, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, like my shirt is private. I don't really want you touching my shirt right now without, you know, said in friendship. <laughs> get it, get it. All right, <laughs> but. But uh, it's not hidden. Like I, it's it's just it's or you shouldn't drink my drink or whatever. You know, like you can have private things that aren't hidden. And and um, I think this this hidden thing comes from the history of computer science, where we needed to have protected areas of memory so programs wouldn't crash mm -hmm. so easily, and we need to have security and secure directories in our file systems and all that kind of stuff. And so now we're trying to apply it to society. It's stupid as a way to think about people, though. My concern, the concern this brings up to me is, do we get to the point where if we're all having an AR experience all the time that we customize, is that the ultimate subjectivity of truth? Now we may, we may watch a certain news channel because it tells us the news we want to see and you're watching a different news channel and you get something different. What if we're all seeing what we want to see just in the world? Does that drive right, us further right. apart? Absolutely. Well, yeah. as I say in the book, VR potentially could be the creepiest technology of all time. So it has. It I has. just blank out people I don't want to see walking that's down the, the street. That's the connection I see is exactly the ability yeah, yeah. to deliver well, unique look, experiences. Um, there. That's a great danger. Yeah. Um, and we're lucky we have a chance to try to fix this stuff in the era of smartphones and smart speakers before we get to VR or some kind of direct brain mm -hmm. thing or whatever there, whatever there might be. Um, the current devices are pretty crude, and this is the time when we should work out these power relationships and how a society can work with them. Mm -hmm. um, I. Uh, I mean, the, the theme of, of Dawn of the New Everything is more or less this dual nature of technology that it can do all of these wonderful, creative, sweet things, then it can also be so degrading and so manipulative and so dark and so dangerous. And those, those things are equally true. Um, and and uh, this question of what makes something go one way or the other way is, is the deepest question of our times as a technological sp uh, species. We have to learn how we bring out the best of ourselves and our tech as we get more and more powerful. And uh, I was saying before, you know, I used to think it was all about rhetoric. That's why I was bugging uh, William Gibson to make neuromancer more positive, which is one of the more silly things I've ever done in my life. But I was young. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, um, uh, I've come to think that what really makes the most difference is economics and economic incentives, that ultimately they, they seem to drive things more than rules and laws and traditions and rhetoric and all this stuff. And so if we have economic incentives that um, reward people 
more more for things that are non creepy than for things that are <laughs> creepy, you know, <laughs> then maybe we'll have a less creepy world. And right now, by definition, yeah. the only thing that's rewarded is the creepy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's that's just a bizarre thing. Like you look at the money that a company like Google makes, and almost all of it is from somebody being convinced that they paid money in order to change somebody else's behavior in a way that the person wasn't fully aware of, that they got some kind of advantage where they were able to sneakily get at people. It's a bizarre, bizarre, bizarre system, and it it can't scale. I mean, you might think it's big, but it's not as big as it could be if we had like direct brain links and we're like a civilization that's just based on people trying to trick each other is no civilization at all. Yeah. You know? Total information awareness. Yeah, I still worry that people are going to keep doing it. That's oh, my that's my biggest yeah. That's my ongoing. As, as 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 we yeah. near towards close, I, I, I want to make a quick point that combines VR and social media. Yeah, and you. Yes. Uh, late was it? No, or I guess it was earlier this year. I wrote a, a story on CNET just about some of my concerns and feedback about the current generation of VR. Just this is not the generation of hardware that's going to mainstream it. Basically, even though I'm a big fan and I like this and I like that, mm -hmm. I get a lot of vitriolic responses, which I fully expected. But my favorite was from someone pretending to be you on Twitter, who sent me a nasty note uh, with you and your picture and a link to your website and their Twitter bio. So there you go. I, I was trolled by your by your fake Twitter doppelganger. Yeah, yeah, and so this is a kind of interesting problem. So I there's a bunch of fake me's, including one called Real Jaron Lanier on Twitter. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of fake me's on Facebook. There's a bunch of fake me's on um, Reddit and whatever. And the problem is that the companies don't let you complain about them mm -hmm. unless you join. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to join any of these things. I think they're yeah. terrible schemes. I really don't want to join Twitter. That was our question. I do like you, people Do you Twitter sneak in and do you peek do you at, on news at, at these at networks all? at all? No, I hear about these stories from people like you. Okay. Some, sometimes my I students will tell me all these funny things. My daughter checks them out too. She's mm -hmm. 11, and she said one of she told me that one of the Jaron Lanier's on one of, I forget which service there might, it might have been one on Instagram or something uh, is giving people relationship and breakup <laughs> advice, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. okay, fine, you know. I got knocked by fake and Jaron I, and real Palmer Lucky on Twitter, so and, I feel like I've accomplished something. You, yeah, you, yeah, you, you have. You can die now. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how real Palmer Lucky's been lately, but that's another yeah. story. We should check in on him in 10 years and see where he's gotten to. Yes. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so <laughs> I asked her if the advice was any good, and she said, not really. <laughs> and I kind of trust her on that. So I, I tend to think that probably it's not worth listening to any of the fake mm -hmm. Jaron Lanier's out on social media. Um, it's interesting, like... Um, a certain major media organization wanted to do something on Facebook Live, and I mentioned to them that there could be fake me's that they, you know, that would participate. Yeah. And their lawyer looked into it, and they decided they couldn't do it on that mm. basis. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's what it's an example of a, of how creepy things are. That like, uh, it's not just I, I, this. This this is part part of why I feel like this whole business plan, uh, which I call the bummer business plan. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. Uh, yeah, um, uh, behaviors of users modified and made available for rent or something like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, One of the problems with it is it becomes like a protection racket, but it's an existential one. Like you pay us or nobody will be able to hear you or know you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a kind of an ugly business model, but that is kind of what's happening. So it's like now um, either join Facebook or we'll drown you out with fake versions mm -hmm. of yourself. And, you know, it's it's not ethical. It's uh, it's Kafkaesque and, and bizarre and ugly. Um, and uh, But you're given no option. Um, if you're not on Facebook, do you really exist? That's the next book. Well, I mean, the way you kill things these days is with denial of service yeah. attacks. So if somebody wanted to kill my website, which is not good enough for anybody to give a shit about. Oh, pardon my language. Should I? You can, all right, anyway. Um, We're like an hour in. If, if you've listened this long, you can handle that. Yeah. All right, OK. <laughs> but anyway, if somebody wanted to kill my website, instead of hacking it, they do denial of service, right? They'd get their botnet to, mm -hmm. to bombard it. And But the same thing's happening culturally. Like if somebody, want, if, if somebody wants to kill speech now, they just create a whole bunch of bots that are similar but different and create this storm of garbage, and then they disrupt the speech. And that's approximately was what was done to say Hillary Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I gotta say, I, um, this isn't a partisan thing. I think I think we could just as easily have had the first uh, social media addict president coming from the left, and I think it would be just as bad. I don't think it's a left-right thing. I'm depressed now. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my job. <laughs> That seems like a good. That seems like a good dark note to. Uh, I'm gonna quit everything. To That's it. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
But if you want to feel even for worse, time. you can read 10 arguments for deleting your social media accounts right now. But if you want to feel better, you can read, read Dawn of the New Everything. That's right. Yeah, which yeah. Yeah. spans yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of your life and, and it's, it's so not fast just there. about... VR, it's about art and about... And if you go back and forth between them, you can give yourself positive and negative negative stimuli in order to control your own Skinner box and That's modify right. your behavior. We're all living in a pyramid. We're all living oh, in a yeah. pyramid <laughs> Stanford prison experiment. Just create your perfect... Yeah, exactly. All right. Dovetails. Cool. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Jeff. Hey, yeah, thanks for thank having you, me. Of course. It's fun talking to you guys. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks a lot for Jaron for being on. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe on YouTube, or if you want to listen to it as a podcast, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thanks a lot. I'm Scott Stein. We'll see you soon.